knock on my door vibrates loudly. Echoes throughout the hallway. Looking out the peephole of the door, I see a large man in uniform. It's the captain. Let me in, you useless waste of space, he says. I open the door, and he tosses me the keys. Here you go, kid, as promised. I catch the keys and walk over to the window, peering outside. I don't say a word, and leave my apartment running down the steps, racing to my new car. What do you think? he asks. I love it, I exclaim. Lifting the hood, seeing all the modifications to the car. <laughs> Is she even street legal? I ask. Nope, but she's all yours. Hey, let's go for a ride, he insists. We hop in the car. The two front seats have been replaced with racing seats. He even has the safety harness seatbelts. Starting the car. The engine roars fiercely. Revving her up, she purrs like a lion, taking off at a high rate of speed, shifting into second, then third gear, driving around recklessly for a while, eventually heading back home. Captain says, Okay, settle down. Glad you liked the car. Now, let's get down to business. Here's all the info I have on the judge. Good luck, kid. After speaking to the captain for a while, I learn the judge's schedule and begin attending his court hearings. I want to see this asshole in action firsthand. Arriving at the courthouse, going through the metal detectors, wondering to myself as I empty my pockets if it would be possible to commit a killing in a courtroom. Assessing the dangers, no, far too risky. I see there are tons of officers and deputies all over the place. That plan is out. Walking around a bit, eventually finding the right courtroom. I read the list of cases on the outside of the door. The Honorable Jennifer Turner. Oh, no. There must be some mistake. Calling the captain once more. Hey, I think you gave me the wrong room number. It's a woman judge, I say, frustrated. Yeah, kid, that's her, the captain utters. I begin stuttering over my words. Uh, <laughs> I don't feel comfortable doing this. He pauses. Oh, don't you worry, kid. You will, trust me. Sit in for the sentencing of today's hearing. Listen to all the facts, and then make your decision, the captain explains. It's almost 8.45. Today's trial begins soon. I take a seat in the back. Wearing a decently tailored suit I had acquired recently, well... It's not tailored, actually, but it fits perfect. Whoever died in this had good taste. All rise. The Honorable Judge Turner presides, the bailiff speaks. Reaching in front of me, grabbing the hard wooden row of seats. Jeez, I really have to get back to the gym. I've gotten lazy. I stand up, slowly. The deputy glances in my direction. I begin feeling uncomfortable as he's looking at me like I'm a cheeseburger. Hey, buddy, this isn't Burger King. You can't have it your way. Please be seated, the judge orders. The trial goes on for hours as each attorney battles back and forth, each trying to discredit the other's circumstantial evidence and witnesses. I learn that the defendant has killed a pair of twins in front of their mum while she watched in horror, brutally raped each little girl, stabbing them to death as the mother looked on in disgust. She sat three rows in front of me. I was seated in a way I could see her reactions as they brought forth the crime scene photos. It broke my heart as the mom relived each moment over and over again in front of everyone. The mother was bound and gagged in the home, tied to a post and left for dead, until a concerned neighbor eventually called the police for a welfare check. The man who committed these heinous acts was eventually found guilty, but was given only a three-year sentence, and would most likely serve half of that term. The courtroom burst into complete and utter chaos as sentence was given, the family of the victims shouting loudly. Several men forced their way to the killer and began assaulting him. 
deputies begin pouring in, trying to gain control and bring order in the courtroom. It was madness. I slowly walk out, completely disgusted with this judge. How could anyone be alright with that result? Well, I will fucking end you. I promise, you won't be walking free like these rapists and killers. You are just as guilty as they are, if not more so, putting everyone in danger. After making the decision to kill her, yes, I know, it goes against my principles, I can't let this slide. I begin following her and stalking her every move, learning her schedule, finding her home. She goes jogging in a nearby park late at night. The path she runs on is dimly lit and not visited by many people. So, I wait. Each night hiding in the woods, finding the opportune time and place to strike. Footsteps are nearing me as I hide behind a tree. Eating a protein bar I brought with me, I'm kneeling down, remaining motionless. Hearing branches breaking and leaves rustling. A woman grows near. I can see a figure get closer and closer. My heart racing, I jump out from behind the tree and lunge my knife right into the woman's stomach. Hearing her grunt, gasping for air, she looks up at me, begging for mercy. In horror, I look back at the woman, realizing I've just stabbed the wrong woman. I can't see her entirely, but I'm certain this isn't her. This girl is young, and the judge must be in her fifties. I'm in all black with a mask on. She hasn't seen my face. I lift her up over my shoulder, running with her as I try to put pressure on the wound. Arriving to my car, I toss this mystery woman onto plastic. She passes out from blood loss. It's dark. I can't see her face. Opening my car door, the overhead dome light illuminates the vehicle. Complete shock. I now see the woman before me. I begin hyperventilating as the sudden realization overwhelms me. It's Miranda. I toss her in the back seat, turning over the engine, speeding off, driving like hell to the nearest hospital, speeds reaching well over a hundred miles an hour. I'm hauling ass, driving faster than I've ever driven before, passing cars going into oncoming traffic. She's losing blood rapidly. I can't keep pressure on her wound and shift gears simultaneously. I'm freaking out, breathing heavily, yelling at the cars in front of me, looking back every so often. Stay with me, I yell. Ten minutes later, we arrive at the ER, screeching to a halt. The car stops quickly. Carrying her into the ER, I cry out. I need a doctor, now. This girl has been stabbed. She needs blood immediately. She's rushed into surgery. I begin filling out paperwork as they question me about the circumstances. I tell them I just found her like that. Sitting in the hospital ER waiting area, my nerves are getting the best of me. I can't stand this any longer. My heart's pounding in my chest, worried if she'll make it. She lost so much blood. I'm now in the surgery part of the hospital. The doctor comes out. I rush to him. Is she going to be okay? I ask intently. She's in serious but stable condition. She may need one more surgery. Currently she's unconscious. I think she's going to pull through. It's best she stay here a while though. It's a good thing you got here when you did. If she lost any more blood, she certainly would have died. You're a hero, he explains. He pats me on the shoulder and walks away. Walking over to the nurse's station, I ask one of the ladies there which room she's in. Room 347, sir. Just down the hall. She's in recovery, but she isn't awake, the girl says. Okay, thank you, I respond, walking towards the room. I see two officers heading towards me. Heart racing. Oh, crap. They're going to question me. Excuse me, sir. Can we talk to you for a moment? One of them says. I stop and look around as if I had no idea who they were talking about. What? 
Oh, sure, yeah. How can I help you fellas? I ask. Just needed some info for our report. Is that your car out front of the hospital? The other officer asks. Yeah, that's mine, I tell them. And you found this woman injured in the park on a path? The officer inquired. Yeah, I think she was attacked. Not sure what happened. I rushed her here as soon as I found her, I explain. I read the report given to the nurse. Well, there's only one problem we have with that, he says. He looks at the other officer, who's now holding a plastic bag with a bloody knife. We found that in your car. Can you explain this? Glaring at the officers for a moment, I look left, then to the right, seeing exit signs. Making a run for it, I take off at a high rate of speed, blowing past nurses and patients, knocking over machines, tripping over my own over-exaggerated movements, falling to the ground, jumping back up, almost to the end of the corridor. I'm about to turn the corner and run down the stairs as I plow into two more officers. These men are large. One of them falls backwards. The other grabs me and slams my body to the floor as the first two officers catch up. I try bringing up a fight, but I'm soon overwhelmed and overpowered. Face first on the floor, out of breath from running and fighting, I'm placed in handcuffs. Hauled off to the police station. I say nothing on the way there. Being booked and questioned, I try to hide my identity hoping I'll only be charged with a simple assault. Sitting in a chair as one of the officers is searching the database. I see the captain on the other side of the station. I call out to him. He ignores me. Acts like he doesn't even know me. Damn. Looks like I'm all alone now. Lost my best friend, my girl, my mentor. And now, my freedom. The police finish searching through my car, finding several knives and many guns, rope, duct, tape, and so much more. I see one man logging them all into evidence, each with their own little clear plastic bag, including the one they showed me at the hospital. In county jail now, waiting for my court date. I make a phone call to my father, asking if there's anything he can do informing him I have money in a safety deposit box, but he'll have to come and get the key for it. Dad, I need a good lawyer. You have to help me, I say. Okay, kid, I'll see what I can do, he replies. Dad shows up and declares my keys as his own property, making me feel like he's on my side, in and out of court. I learn they've searched my home and found everything. Months go by as I try to contact my father. I haven't seen or spoken to him since he visited and took my keys. No one comes to see me. No friends, no family. The captain won't answer or return my calls. <laughs> I don't blame him. I wouldn't want to be in this shithole either. My next court hearing is tomorrow. I make an appearance and learn they now have all the evidence they need to put me away for good. I never did get a high-paid lawyer. Simply, a public defender. Well, if you're unaware, public defenders are paid by the government, but they work on behalf of clients who can't otherwise afford private representation. If you're charged with a crime that could lead to incarceration, but you're unable to afford a private attorney, then you may be eligible for public defense. This is also referred to as court-appointed representation. Now, it's difficult to really get good representation, as most of them could have thousands of cases they're dealing with at one time. Meaning, the quality of your defense is well, next to nothing. DNA samples are found on my knives from the deceased. After conducting weapons checks and comparing bullet fragments found at multiple crime scenes, I'm charged with a whole laundry list of crimes. Of course, pleading not guilty. My sentencing comes, and they read the verdict. Guilty on all counts, the man says. My heart falling from my chest as I hear those words. 
Life without the possibility of parole, the judge orders. I'm sent to a federal prison, where I learn many of the gang members' friends and families that I killed are incarcerated. This is either going to be a long-ass prison sentence, or a very short one. The food here, as you can no doubt imagine, is horrible. You're looked at and deemed less than human from the staff. I feel like a caged animal. The blank smell of concrete and metal everywhere. Clawing at the cage door, attacking it, wanting to break out and kill once more. Labeled a threat, a danger to other inmates, I'm housed in the section of the prison with some of the worst criminals imaginable. Thinking to myself, this would be the perfect place to vet my marks from within. Just because I'm not on the outside, doesn't mean I have to stop killing. My thirst for murder has not yet been quenched. Talking to other inmates, informing them that I'm looking for a weapon. One man tells me I should go to the prison metal shop and talk to one of them. A man known as the Friday Night Bandit. Thinking for a moment. Wait a minute. Isn't that the guy who robbed all those banks? I meet him the following day and strike up a conversation. He looks at me as if I'm interrupting him. The man is focused, driven, determined. I can tell he's in deep thought of something important. Only, not his job in the metal shop. Scanning over me a moment, he asks, What the hell do you want? Caught off guard by his intense presence, I ask him, So I hear you're the man to talk to if I need something special. Looking back down at his work table, sharpening some piece of metal, he says, Well, that depends what you're looking for, friend. In prison, almost anything can be traded as collateral. That all depends on who the person is and what they like. They might be after simple snacks or cigarettes, but it could be a wide range, anywhere from books to drugs. That's the currency in prison. Eventually, I get a job in the prison shop with him, and we talk almost daily sometimes being interrupted by guards, as I'm not always paying attention to my job, <laughs> slacking off, only there to hang out with my new friend. He opens up and tells me he's gained the trust of many guards, carrying with him a sack. Oftentimes he smuggles items from the prison shop. I ask him if he's trading those items for anything. He nods his head back and forth, signaling no. I've been carving into the concrete blocks over the past few months. I'm going to break the hell out of here, he whispers. I look at him, laughing. <sighs> Come on, man. Don't be foolish. It can't be done. This is a maximum security prison, I urge. Well, weeks pass as he tells me the progress he's made. Intrigued, I ask him how he's getting rid of the mess he's making. What kind of tools he's using. He begins to explain his method, telling me that he hangs a sheet over the prison cell so he can't be seen when he's working on the concrete wall. Even how he's hollowed out the window unit of the outside, cutting the rebar, fashioning a dark blanket over his prison uniform. One day, I arrive at the metal shop and he says, Hey man, I made you a set of tools. You should get started soon. I won't be here much longer. I laid your tools onto your mattress. Oh, good luck. I begin cutting away at the wall, using his method. This work is harder than anything else I've ever done. Each night I dedicate hours to removing one block after another, seeing the problems that he faced. I've been going at this for months now. My friend has since escaped. I must be careful, as the security is heightened even more so now adding guards to the towers, even canine units surrounding the prison. The bunk checks are even more frequent. I go out to the yard every day making notes of each guard's movements and schedules, trying to find any weakness. The canines walk around the entire outside of the prison every ten minutes, so my window of time will be short. 
They added another truck that drives around as well. My plan has failed. All that work for nothing. After weeks of watching them, I realize it'll be almost impossible to escape the same way he did. Now with more guards around the perimeter, I must come up with a new plan. Still working my job in the prison metal shop, I begin to devise a new plan to escape. I notice there's a large box truck that comes in and picks up different items made by the inmates in prison. Working as a welder, I begin to familiarize myself with the truck's delivery schedule. I observe the trucks going in and out, and the officers and how they conduct a search of the vehicles, looking for weaknesses in the security checks. Correctional officers have a mirror they use to look up under the truck attached to a long metal pole. They open the back door and search the inside, ensuring no inmates are hiding within. I realize the only way I can escape is to make myself invisible. This particular truck is a large box truck, with an interesting layout in the undercarriage. When no one was looking, I would slide under the truck very quickly and measure the width and length of the frame rail. With the measurements, I go back to my workstation in the prison metal shop. There are screens around me as I work, protecting from the spread of sparks flying everywhere to prevent a fire. It would also prevent anyone from seeing what kind of work I would be doing. Using a piece of plywood lying around the shop, I painted completely black. After that I began making clothes for myself for after the escape. Using prison shirts, I cut them short and sew patches over the numbers, so as to look like regular civilian clothes made pants into shorts, even created cargo pockets. Using cigarettes, I began trading them for information about the surrounding area, asking where to hide and how to survive upon escape in the local towns nearby. Weeks pass as I get all my gear ready. This is it. The truck is here and about to leave. Grabbing all my supplies, I quickly hide under the truck placing the plywood face down with the black paint showing. Using my custom-made board as a platform, I conceal myself in the chassis of the truck, so that when they use the mirror, it will reflect only darkness. Laying down on top of the wooden plank, I position myself the best I can. Holding on to the metal frame rails, I obtained a mask to protect myself from debris and fumes. Preparing myself now for the hazardous ride, my entire escape plan hinges on an illusion. I hear the men walk around the truck, examining it. The engine starts, and it begins to drive forward. It's approximately 4 p.m. as the truck takes off, exiting the prison. A massive relief washes over me, as my heart is still pumping rapidly. An hour passes, as the truck comes to a stop at a local gas station. Jumping out from my hiding spot, I run into the nearby woods. After eight months behind bars, I'm on the run, all alone, with no friends and no money. I begin hitchhiking, getting several rides. I move to the nearest town, eating food from dumpsters, even begging for change at some point. Remembering my discussions with my inmate friend, I move to a department store and hide in plain sight. Knowing the police are canvas in the area, I steal some clothes and put them on, changing out of my custom prison clothes I'd been wearing, deciding now that I can't leave the store until the police presence dies down. <laughs> now I have all the food and drinks I could want. I create a hiding place, stay here for a while, stealing knives and the other tools I need. This place has everything. Knowing I need to stay on the move though, I leave the area. Wearing a hat, trying to disguise myself. Heading to Jordan's old restaurant. Trying to get back any normalcy in my life. I notice a police cruiser is heading in my direction. Acting like I don't see the car, I head across the street. The car screeches to a halt. Yelling is heard a few feet away. Thomas, get in, damn it. I gotta get you out of here. A man says. I look over to see the captain. Knowing I'm running out of options, 
I run and hop in the back seat. Holy shit, how'd you find me? I ask. I've just been driving around any location I thought you might run to. <laughs> I'm getting back to what you know. I'd heard you escaped, so I've been trying to find you before they do. Look, here's your new identity. He explains, handing me an envelope. I open it and see passports, money, and other documents. Where are we going? I ask. We aren't going anywhere, but you are. Ever since you got locked up, I've been talking to a friend of yours. A former inmate. You remember him. He told me that when I found you, that you are to meet him in Havana. Here's a phone and keys to the boat he left for you. I'm taking you to the border. Hey, good luck, kid. Reaching southern Florida, I locate the boat that was left for me and begin heading south to Havana. After days of travel and constantly stopping to fuel up every so often, my voyage comes to an end. Arriving at the port, instructed to me on the envelope. I'm greeted by a well-dressed man as soon as I dock the boat. Ride this way, sir, he says. Just then, I see a familiar face. <laughs> it's the man I met at the prison shop, the bank robber. Welcome to Cuba, Kendall speaks. We'll get started as soon as you're ready, he says. I look at him, puzzled. Ready for what? I inquire. He looks at me with a huge grin on his face. A partnership. You help me rob banks and casinos. I'll finance your kills. I want to take this worldwide. Oh, prepare yourself. There's a storm coming. A big one.